Good day, this is Brad Kayla, PhD, and my PhD stands for Post Hole Digger. Today, I would like to deal with something that has been on my mind for a very long time. We're talking about Christian oxymorons exposed, restorative justice, PMS versus PMS, number 52. PMS for the first situation stands for physical, mental and spiritual. That means this is the site of God and the site, the verses of Beelzebub stands for politics, money and spirituality or religion. The difference between a spiritual church and a carnal church. Both Origen and Apostle Paul try to convey to us a great truth. The difference between a spiritual church and a carnal church as follows. And this is where I really got excited because my whole life I was trained, I was taught, I was pressured into believing certain things. But I never really questioned the people that shared with me their beliefs because the reality was, what do you know? When you're a child, you accept that your pastor or your priest or the Bible Sunday school teacher or Bible school teacher, whatever you call them, teach you. When you're a little bit older, you continue your education. You either go to seminary or to Bible school or to some other school and you will continue. And then something happens in your life. And that is where you start to wonder, what in the world am I doing? Why do I believe what I believe? Is this questioning yourself? <coughs> See, the big question is, what is it in our lives that make us move? You wonder, maybe you don't even wonder, maybe you never thought about it. But somebody, somewhere, somehow has inspired you to believe what you believe. Maybe it was your mom, maybe it was your dad, maybe it was your grandfather or your oma, opa. I don't know. Or maybe it was a story about somebody that cared so much for others, inspired you to become a person similar like the one you had seen. But genuine religion is like a marriage. It's a spiritual sacrament to your partner or of the other partner. See, reality is also that only two people can be part of that relationship, a man and a woman, according the PMS that we are following first, physical, mental, as well as spiritual. God designed us to be a unit, a spiritual sacrament of sex. And to perceive that and to understand the pattern as a natural law for this world or our society. So many things are happening this year, particularly with the pandemic and also with the politic political area that we are seeing in the United States. Can we stop this weird conundrum and develop our own mind sufficiently to interpret the reality or the natural law of this world. Like every famous painter, each brush stroke gives us away, gives away the identity of the master. Who painted the drawing is like the author's self-portrait. In other words, each time you see a painting, you will recognize a Monet, or you will not recognize a Van Gogh, or you will recognize the painter that was behind it, if it is a master, you will recognize it. And this is what I experienced personally with God. So let's treat it that we are searching for who designed this world. And do we recognize God's design in the smallest particles of this universe, of all creation? Just as an example, the fire hazards in California, uh, it is 
terrible. Normally you have a couple of fires and they become bigger and bigger and now we're talking two, three, four hundred acres in a few hours and it is worse than ever before. It's not just only bad fires happen but the response, the result of the fires are so high that they go into the universe, we think. But somewhere, somehow, way at the other side of the world, Japan, Indonesia, or other areas, we will find the smog and we'll find the debris. It has affected other parts of the world. And similar with us, if we spew out all the garbage out of our system, as a human being, somehow, somewhere, it affects somebody else. And if we go back now to the original people that got an agreement or had an agreement with God the Father, the true Hebrew of the Jewish people would never worship a tribune God. In other words, they knew there was one God, one God. Folks, contrary to Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. Aristotle was a student of Plato and he became the teacher of Alexander the Great. Now Alexander the Great prayed to all kinds of gods and he had a god of the underworld and his name was Serapis. This was in 325 BC, before Christ, and the followers of Serapis were called Christians. Folks, do you hear what I'm saying? They were called Christians, and the fellow in charge of those Christians was called a bishop. Isn't that interesting? Now, a true Hebrew gazes upon the vision of the Gentiles and perceives God in his ultimate reality, where all things are one. In other words, a dwelling place of the unbegotten, the ancient of days. So when the Jewish part people got together and I'm talking about the people from the early days. They relied on the information they got from Abram and Abram got his information from other people. But you know who those other people were? They were the followers or the grandchildren of Adam and Eve. And there was a man by the name of Enoch and he had learned his lessons from his great, great, great grandfather. And he walked with God. He talked with God. It was an awesome experience. Now, in, if every aspect of creation, creation is imbued with God's DNA, then we can formulate every element of our life to see these forces at work. See, if we are created according to God's image, then God's image should be found somewhere in our lives. That is what we like to see. Because our generation has for almost every reason, for everything, an algorithm. They should be able to agree that we can formulate the element of life to see these forces at work, saturated with God's DNA. In other words, our scientific mind should be strong enough to come up with a solution and to recognize God's DNA. Let's check it out. I hope that you stay with me for the moment because there is something funny that we don't realize. I used to live in Canada for 35 long years. And when I came over back to Europe, I hardly recognized anything because I was so focused in getting to know North America with my work and everything that I was involved in that for a very strange reason, it took me a very long time to get back to the things that I learned as a kid. And so when we change course in our lifestyle, we have sometimes, we call it a paradigm shift, we have a problem. Because a paradigm shift, we are so locked in with our thoughts in a particular direction that in order to shift our direction, we take some time. 
So I'm going to deal with a variation, how the Jewish people are looking at an aspect and how we as people that are non-Jews, the Jews call that Choyen, we are foreigners, we are strangers, we are not used to thinking in the philosophy of a Hebrew or a Jewish person. So if the past is female regarding to the future, which is male, then we manifest the third force when we make ourselves conscious of the moment in which we are dwelling. In other words, the future is female, a male, the past is female, and now we are in the now, and we are dwelling in the moment. So if this outer world is female with regards to the heavens, which are considered male, then we have an example of the proverbial four points, the north, the south, the east, and the west, throughout the scriptures. We also understand the need to turn our focus eastward, towards the rising of the sun. So once we know the symbolism, we then perceive the meaning of the words, after he drove men out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden, cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. This is in Genesis 3 verse 24. The cerebrum with the flaming sword represents a law or barriers we must overcome to re-enter the kingdom of God. So if we do Genesis 3 verse 24, the complete Jewish Bible, so he drove men out and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden, the cerebrum, and a flaming sword which, which turned in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. A law is both a limitation as well as a gate that permits only the one who has the key to enter beyond its barrier. When an embryo is fertilized in the womb, so we're going back now to something that we can understand when a little baby is established when husband and wife get together and there's a little embryo that got fertilized then the natural laws go to work the natural laws will hold the little fetus inside of the belly of the mother till it is ready to show up this takes about nine months sometimes they're a little bit early sometimes they're a little bit later but the little fetus grows and as, as it is growing and maturing and over a period of nine months it is ready to come on this earth this is basically what we are seeing spiritually as well this realm is said to be female until we have attained a certain maturity and perfection that enables us to move beyond the three dimensional limits of this world so like a fetus the fetus will be pushed and pushed and when it's ready it comes outside okay and that is also with us spiritually when we are living in this world and growing and maturing and understanding we are getting to a level of understanding about god where we are pushed beyond that three dimensional limit i hope that this will make sense for you Now, I hope you remember that we're talking about what is the DNA from God? What is the spiritual church versus a carnal church? Because that is what happened in a paradise. When Adam and Eve focused on listening to Satan, Beelzebub, in the form of a snake, they automatically got themselves out of the presence of God. And in order to make ourselves become aware of this, we have to study and we have to understand a few things. And that means that we have to listen to Jesus or Jesuwa HaMashiach. Most people know him as Jesus. 
Now, the way of poets and the philosophers and most of the Asian religions and even the Christian Gnostics, the disciples of Paul, was to abandon all desire and presence of this world. In other words, they became people that just focused on the spiritual aspect. They based this doctrine on the common belief among the Christian Gnostics that the creator of this world and the God of the Jews was an evil demerit. And the Mertz is a platonic deity who orders or fashions the material world out of chaos, which can be defined as a subordinate God who fashions his material world under a carnal national state of being. In other words, it's chaos. Now, from the perception of reality, Jesura came to condemn the God of the Jews, the chaos and to reveal to humanity that they can only find the true God when they reject the world's false God creator. From their vision of religion and creation, everything physical was evil and was to be denied. Contrary to the modern theologians and biblical experts who are reluctant to admit the truth, the doctrine is much founded in Paul's epistles and his constant reference to the necessity of putting to death the desires of the flesh and the rejection of the God of this world. The apostles' problem was not necessarily one and significant truth to these Pauline and Gnostic Christian concepts. We must understand as valid entry-level doctrines that can be categorized as milk for Gnostic babies or immature spiritual Christians. The difficulty that I just explained is what keeps all the religions separate, because everyone has his own understanding. But the biblical way, and when I say the biblical way, I should correct myself, the spiritual way of God is that there is a difference of dimension. We are thinking in a milk situation. As people in this world, we think three-dimensional. So the difference between a Hebrew holy man and an Essene or Ebionite as versus the Gentiles, the difference is basically in the different perception and understanding of the very definition of evil itself. The pagan and the Pauline Gentile Gnostic Christians viewed the spirit as useful, whatever is of the physical as evil. In other words, they saw that everything what was physical, if you had long hair as a man, uh-oh, if you wear earrings and nose and you shape, you know, as women really like to make themselves pretty, that was considered evil. The Hebrew visionary saw beyond the entry-level doctrine and perceived that the root cause of sin was the separation of the sexes or divine polarities of creation. See, when we look at creation, creation as male and female. The expressions in the Bible are male and female. When we go to the east, the west, and the north, and the south, they, those are points that the Bible refers to. But the polarities of, crea of creation, instead of seeking to align themselves to the one polarity and reject the other, the Hebrew rose above the rest of the world's religions and the philosophies by merging the two into a higher reality than either of the total of the parts. In other words, it was men and female, male, female, men and women. Together they formed God Almighty. Together they were in harmony. So once properly understood, it was for the very reason that Trinity's doctrine is not found explicitly declared in the Hebrew Scriptures. Because there is one God. And that one God says very simple. In the Old Testament, we never find anything about the Trinity. It's only in the New Testament that people, from a Gentile's perspective, look at it differently. So, what makes those conflicting doctrines so difficult for the carnal mind to comprehend is that we have a truth opposing another truth. 
So what Paul taught respecting the God of this world was the truth. But a higher truth was beyond the understanding of Paul's Gentile world. So let's go back for a moment to the little fetus. When the little fetus is sitting there and it's growing and maturing to a level of nine months, when it is mature enough to be exposed to the world, to society, if you would have been able to communicate and tell them, listen, this is what is going to happen. You have to go to school. What? What is school? They don't know. They have no clue because they are just barely a fetus that is growing into a mature little baby. And when it comes out, that is when it starts to realize there is more to it. And the same with this world. When we are growing up, we mature to a level where we come to understand that God is a almighty God. But there is an other aspect that we have to go beyond. And that's a spiritual aspect. If God states something, he expects us to follow that. And if we refuse that, we, have to, we are totally in our right to refuse that then we have a problem and that is what we are facing right now. People that are getting themselves exposed to the election board, they have a right, they have a vote, they can vote in a president and then they vote Mr. Trump in, they got themselves a problem because the reality is that from a spiritual aspect they were totally free to vote for whoever they wanted to vote. But if they would have understood the aspect of a spiritual church versus a carnal church, they would understood that a leader is a person that is married to one woman, is not a wine bibber, is of sound mind, doesn't lie, doesn't cheat, and a whole bunch of other things. This is the spiritual aspect. Now, if we go to the carnal aspect, we say, well, you know, all we have to do is say, praise the Lord, and you belong to Jesus. And Mr. Trump, being a good salesman, says, praise the Lord, and holds his Bible upside down because he has no clue. He couldn't care less as long as he got your vote. So the carnal mindset will choose for a person that sounds good. The spiritual aspect the spiritual church will go where the way, the truth, and the light is. And that one states very simple that if a man lies and cheats, he won't enter the kingdom of God because liars won't enter the kingdom of God. And so we have a little problem. Can we transpose ourselves? Can we get over that hump? And can we get to the point that we believe that Yeshua said something that was correct. He said, follow the way, follow the truth, follow the light. And why did he urge people to follow that small path? Because on that small path, there is the presence of God. Anytime that we go off that path, we are going the broad way doing whatever we want to do, having ticklish ears, listening to a message that we want to listen to. God is not there. Yes, you sound great. Yes, you sound wonderful. Oh, you have such great songs that it is just incredible. But reality is, is the presence of the Lord there. Now, I can give you example after example, but reality is you need to experience for yourself if you want to follow God, if you want to follow the narrow path, and if it sounds harsh what I say, think about the little fetus. You are talking to the little fetus and you tell them, listen, there is a big world out there and you can live in America, you can live in Canada, you can live in Holland, or you can live in Africa, or you can live in a disaster. Land. Which one do you want to pick? But the little baby is not ready for that. And so this world that we are living in is actually our school to learn to seek the word of God, to seek his presence. And yes, folks, it took me a long time too. It took me six decades. 
And it took me almost a decade to write it down, what I had discovered. I penned down a book, and that's the deception protocol for the prodigal son blueprint. I posted it and published it on Amazon last year, 2019. And the more I thought about it and the more I was challenged to put it in a simple form, I started to work on videos and learning how to put a video together. And now I'm on my way to become 71 years of age. And I am determined to live the life with God Almighty because we had gotten a minimum of 120 years to live. We don't have to be young and die or older and die. We are made to live forever. But if we fail to seek His presence, if we fail to seek the Lord God Almighty, if we fail to do the simple things, to follow the way, the truth, and the light, and we call ourselves anything under the moon except a prodigal son, then we've got a major problem. Because the presence of God is on that small path. And once you get yourself there, now sometimes you have to go through terrible things in order to come to that acceptance. For me, it was jail time. I was sitting in maximum security, Canadian maximum security, Millhaven, the worst one that you can ever enter. And I was doing six years, times three, while my wife was sent to somewhere else for three years. And we wondered, I wondered, what in the world got me here? And since that I had been 12 years a self-defense because I was not allowed to have a lawyer, after I spent all my money for the first six, uh, six years, I spent over $10 million in defense and preparation of doing the work that we needed to do, I had stepped on the toes of some big dudes called Freemasons. And my friend happened to be the head of the Freemasons. And I had declined his offer to participate in a transaction. And he would take revenge by blocking everything. And I never realized how much that meant for them and how much power they had. And that is where I started to recognize everything I believed in, I got exposed to and judged on. Didn't matter what I said. And for 12 years, I was forced to learn the law. And as I came to understand the law, I was told no matter what my intent was, if I intend to do right, it is still wrong because my evidence was not meeting the requirements of the judge. And that is where I realized that is the same as what we believe. What is the evidence? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Have you ever checked out what your evidence is? Why are you praying? Why are you praying this way? and not the other way? Why don't you just follow what Jesua said? Why are you following a pagan Christianity? See folks, those were the questions I asked myself. And as I dug deeper and deeper and deeper, I found the evidence that is called a chronovisor. The Pope, the Roman Catholic Pope, he opened his library, his vault, 53 miles of shelves, books, material. And among them were also books written in Aramaic by people like Josephus Flavius and other books. And they got finally in 1929, someone started to work on them, to translate them. And I got finally a hold of them just recently, or I just passed here. And I started to dig into what how, what, and where. And the more I came to the understanding, the more I realized that we all have been hoodwinked by the deceiver, Beelzebub, the angel of light, because he is jealous of us. We are created according to God's image. That means that you have something godly in you. Although you might say, well, I don't care, I don't care, but you are still God's son. And he will give you an opportunity, and whether you're a woman or a man, that's immaterial. As human beings, we are still at a level where God says, I give you a chance. Please listen careful. And what I'm doing, I'm sharing with you, no matter how much I studied in the Bible, how much I knew about the Bible, 
when I realized that I was a prodigal son, I did what I needed to do. I repented and I turned around and I started to investigate what is it? Why did I fall for this? There's a major campaign going on, folks. And that's why we see all the misery in the United States, because the body of Christ was hoodwinked. The preachers, the pastors, the leadership, they started prophesying about Trump and everyone believed that they needed to support him. He was just doing a good sales job. He's a con man. And if you check out where he does his business, whom he does his business with, then you will find out that unfortunately I was right. I'm not right because I like it. I'm right because I read the sequence of evidence, 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 evidence. And if you have so many write-offs where you pay off little kids because you had sex with them and you don't want your tax default, the, your, your tax papers released because it will come out in the open over and over and over, of course you are ashamed if you are the President of the United States claiming that you are doing the best. All you did was basically your own instinct, filling your pockets, manipulating people, because that's the way you are. We all are that way because we are living in sin unless we turn around. And the turning around for me was falling flat on my face. Maybe this is what was necessary for President Trump to fall flat on his face. I'm not judging because I am not a judge. I'm only sharing with you folks that none of us is perfect. We all need redemption. Take the lead. Seek you first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. You see, when you take his righteousness, you listen to what he says. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. So tough times never last, but tough people do. I wish you all the best. Bye for now.